Amen. Now, what we find here in Mark chapter 4, as in many of the chapters in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, is Jesus Christ um, using parables to teach a message. Right Now, one of the things that we notice here, and, and I kind of want to point this out. It wasn't part of my notes, but um, this is very true. One of the reasons why he taught in parables, now the parables are applications to greater truths. Right, So in this first parable we see he's talking about a sower, someone who's going out and basically planting seeds. He's, he's throwing all the seeds on the ground. Some of them are falling uh, by the wayside, like in the street. Some of them are falling in the rocks and in the crevices, and others falling in the good ground. So this is the example, right? It's a real world example. And he's giving this parable because it symbolizes a greater, it has a greater meaning and a greater truth behind it. Now, one of the reasons why he did this if you look, it says um, in verse 9, after he finishes the parable, he says, And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, so away from the... Because he's speaking this parable to the multitude. Then when he's alone with his disciples, verse number 10 says, They that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without... All these things are done in parables, and he explains why that is. Why, why is it given to his disciples to know, but those that are without, he says, yeah, but unto them it's given to, in parables. Because he's going to explain all the meaning behind that parable to his disciples, but he doesn't explain all the meaning behind the parable to everybody else. Verse number 12, it says, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven unto them. So, and you know, I, I'm probably opening up a big can of worms. I don't want to get too far into this, but he's saying here that I'm teaching them in parables that they're going to see, but they're not really going to get it. And this is something that happened to Israel. They had real hard hearts. And um, I really don't want to get too far into this. It's probably why I didn't even put it in my notes. But when... It, <laughs> the reason why I'm bringing it up because I'm, pre I'm preaching, I'm going to be bringing up my own parable. Okay? And um, parables can be very useful in teaching, but with the parables, you need to have the explanation also. So we're sitting in church today, you're, you know, we're like, this, we're disciples of Christ. Okay? So to us, these parables are given. We can get the understanding. The unsaved, the general public, they're not going to be able to understand the parables and the greater meaning and truths behind it anyways. You need to get saved first. But um, what he says here in verse 13, he says, and he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? He's like, you don't know what this parable means? He says, and how then will you know all parables? So how are you even going to understand any of the parables if you don't understand what this means? And then he goes on and he explains what it means. Now, a lot of times, you have to be careful as well, people will use parables to prop up false doctrine. And when someone comes to you and they say, oh yeah, you know, here's some doctrine from the Bible, and all they ever do to show you proof is going to all a whole bunch of parables, you've got a problem. If we're going to base what we believe off something, it ought to be very clear statements and not just... This is this the truth is like this, right? Now, um, when we go out soul winning, we oftentimes will use parables. Parables can be very useful to teach a greater truth because what it does is it uses things that we understand um, just in everyday life to apply a greater meaning. So, in, like I mentioned, in this case, he's talking about a guy that goes out and, and sows seed. I mean, you go out and plant seed on the ground. There is, um, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of the illustrations that are used in the Bible, they're not as common as they once were. So people had a lot more understanding and could relate to the, some of these parables a lot more um, easily back then because more people were doing it. Like uh, before we became an extremely industrialized nation, um, you know, people were a lot more self-sufficient. So there's a lot more individuals doing their own planting and having their own gardens and understanding a lot more about what he's talking about here. But we have people today that grow up that have no clue how, um, and I'll, I'll admit myself included for a long time up until I started hunting recently, how animals can be processed 
and gutted and, 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 and everything behind how that works. Um, the same thing with, with planting and, and all of the requirements. If you want a garden to grow, there's a lot that goes into it and there's a lot of knowledge. And it's, it's pretty basic knowledge. It's not rocket science, but there's a lot of things that you just need to know in order for everything to work properly, right? The, the proper time to do it, depth, water, sun, I mean, just everything that goes into planning and making sure that you have an area that's got, um, that's hospitable for other insects to come and, you know, the, the bees to cross pollinate and do just do all the stuff involved with um, being able for your, your crops to be fruitful. And um, so a lot of people understood this a lot better. And recently, I was doing some work. I was out doing, last week actually, I was doing some yard work and a bunch, just a bunch of work around the house. And one of the things I was doing was pulling weeds. And it's, it's interesting when you, when you do some basic tasks and some simple things, when they're, when they're used as references in the Bible, you will tend to get a greater understanding of, of the truth that, that Jesus is often teaching or the other places in the Bible are teaching about when you actually are doing that type of work or that, or the, um, you know, for example, now this one's not quite the same because, you know, if you're going around sowing seed, a lot of these are still basic enough. You can still understand what it's talking about, right? These, the parables that are used, you don't have to be, you know, a gardener to understand the concepts of a seed, you know, growing from the ground and things like that. They're all basic enough. But the more that you, that you are involved with these types of things, you do tend to get more of an understanding and, and, and um, meaning out of it. Even though you, understand, you, could, you could get the, 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 the surface meaning, um, the more you get involved with this stuff, you can, um, you can get that bigger wing. Now, I want to go back to this parable real quick because I'm going to be talking about my example of weeds, and that's going to be my parable for the service. But before we get into that, one of the reasons why we started with this parable is because it's, it's similar. So... It, in, in verse number two, he starts off, it says, and he taught them many things by parables. So Jesus is using the parables to do the teaching, right? And said unto them in his doctrine, and he's teaching them doctrine. And then he goes on and, and goes on with the parable. And then he explains it in verse number 15. We're going to start reading in verse number 15. It says, or in verse 14, the sower soweth the word. So he's explaining, okay, here's an example, a guy going around sowing seed. What that guy is really sowing, it's not just, just a physical seed. He said that's, symbol, that's symbolic of the Word of God. He's going out and, and sowing the Word of God to other people. He's going around and basically preaching God's Word to people. That's what he's doing. He's sowing the Word of God. Verse 15, And these are they by the wayside where the Word is sown, but when they have heard... Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their heart. So this is the first example where it says in verse 4, And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. So he's taking that example of birds. I mean, birds, this is common. You'll see a bird come down and eat the seeds off the ground, right? And he's saying what that symbolizes, that symbolizes Satan coming when you're going and you're preaching God's word to someone, and they don't get it. They don't quite receive it. They don't understand what you're talking about. And the devil just comes and just the, what exactly what you were talking about. He just he just takes it away from the heart so that they don't they don't really have any remembrance of it, and they don't think about it anymore. It's just as if you didn't even have that conversation, right? That's one that's one example. That's one thing that can happen when you're sowing the word, when you're preaching the, preaching the gospel, you're preaching um, the Bible. Is that with some people, Satan's just going to come. He's just going to snatch it away. They never received it. But then let's look at the next example. Verse 16 says, And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately re receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Now, the rest of these examples, this one and the next ones, these are all talking about people who get saved because they receive God's word. And oftentimes salvation is, you know, salvation is a new life. We have a new creature. You're born again when you receive God's word, when you believe on it. 
When you believe on, on the word of the Lord, when you believe on Jesus Christ, that's when you get saved. That's when you have a new creature. Just like a seed, when you throw it on the ground, it's going to die. But then that death of the seed brings forth new life. So that new life is formed after the death of the seed and it comes back up with, with new life. In all of the rest of these examples, and the reason why I bring this up is because people will teach the opposite. They'll say, no, see, this proves that you can lose your salvation, which is not true at all. And again, this is that people will, will go to, to parables to try to prove that, saying, see, you know, they didn't have any root in themselves, so they're, they're, they've died off. But... You have, to, you have to be able to take the parable for what it's trying to teach. You can't always take it to all of the extremes of every single aspect of the parable. You have to give it, you know, and, and Jesus Christ himself is explaining this, this parable. So I don't understand how you can take his explanation and add unto it and say that that's not what he's talking about. Because he clearly is. He says, they have heard the word in verse 16 and immediately receive it with gladness. So they're happy. They hear the gospel. They, they receive God's word. They believe. But they have no root in themselves. They're not grounded. They're not founded. And it says, and so they endure for a little time, just like the, the plants that will start to grow up in the, in the stony places. They'll start to grow up, but they can't really get a root down, so they're not going to last long, right? And he's saying that's symbolic of people who don't have root in themselves. They endure for a time, but whenever affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, you know, people start giving you a hard time because you say, well, I believe God's word. I believe the Bible. I believe in Jesus Christ. And this happens a lot. People will hear that. Family, friends will start to hear that and be like, what are you, an idiot? Or they'll start just, just you know, railing on you and, and calling you names. And, and some people can't handle that because they have no root in themselves. They can't, they can't stand firm and be like, no, yeah, that's exactly what I believe. But they, they get offended and they say, okay, well, I'm, I'm just going to shut up. And, and then they basically don't end up bringing forth fruit and doing good work for God because now they've become ashamed and they've become offended and they go off into not really doing anything for the Lord. This is what that symbolizes, is that type of a, of a Christian, someone who gets saved. It doesn't mean that they, they no longer are saved. It doesn't mean that they've lost their eternal life, which is what you receive when you get saved. It just means that, that in this parable, that's demonstrating that type of a person who didn't have any root, so they, uh, they're offended. Verse number 18, let's keep reading. It says, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, in the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. So, this is talking about, you know, again, he's using an example of a, of a plant growing up, but then there's thorns and weeds and other things around it that end up choking out that good plant until, it, until the good plant ends up dying off because there's too many weeds and thorns and everything else that are surrounding it that are not allowing it to continue to grow. And the Bible's saying here, he's relating that, those, those thorns and the weeds, he's, he's referring to that as the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. See, when a Christian, you get saved and you get too hung up on just trying to make money, on just, well, I'll be happy if I can just make a whole bunch of money and just get rich and that that's what my life is about and then you have lusts about other things. It chokes out the word till you become unfruitful because you're just distracted with the things of this world and not with the things of God and your heart is focused on the wrong treasure, on this worldly treasure. It's all going to be burned up and it's all vanity anyways. At the end of your life, when you look back, who cares how much money you've made because it's not going to do you one bit of good in the afterlife. And we are on this earth for such a short period of time. I mean, really, a short period. Even if you live to 100 years old, Compared to eternity is nothing. And the amount of money that you make in this lifetime over that span of even a hundred years, it's all going to be burned up. It's going to come to nothing. God's going to destroy this whole world. So it doesn't matter what we build here. It doesn't matter what you have. It's all going to be gone and come to nothing. So you've enjoyed that for, for you know, a short period of time, maybe, but then you're left with none of it in the afterlife, life, as opposed to being fruitful towards God and God rewarding you 
after you pass on from this life at the judgment seat of Christ when God gives you, literally is going to give you rewards for what you've done for Him. Now what seems to make more sense? Having a lot of wealth and stuff built up on this earth that's just going to vanish in, in, in a very, very short period of time in the grand scheme of things? Or to be building up treasures where you will have those for all eternity? It's a pretty simple question, right? It's a pretty simple answer. But it's easy sometimes in the world that we live in to get distracted from that. Because in order to live that way, you need to have faith. You need to understand that that really is going to happen. It's not something you necessarily see in front of your eyes every day. Although it should be. You should be reading your Bibles every day because then you will be thinking about the things of God on a regular basis and reminding yourself, no way, life is more than just feeding my belly with food. It's more than just living in a comfortable place. It's more than having vehicles and boats and toys and whatever else. It's way more than that. Those things mean nothing. There's a lot more to my life that I need to be doing to serve God and earning my, my rewards in heaven with Him. That's what we need to be focused on. And then it says, and that's, that's the, in verse 19, that was the people who get caught up with that other stuff and get distracted with that. So that it says they become unfruitful, meaning they're not bringing forth fruit to God. They're just, just doing their own thing. And then in verse 20, it says, And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundred. And that's the people who, who realize the importance of serving God and are actually fruitful in doing God's work and bringing other people unto Christ, teaching others, and, and helping other people out in that regard. Now, in my parable, as I was doing the weeds, I was thinking about this because I was gaining, I was just thinking like, man, weeds, weeds are so much like sin. And that's very, in this parable is basically saying the same thing, right? The, the tares in this example of the sower were the cares of this world, the lusts, the other things that are distracting you from serving God. Those are what, what they call, he calls them tares or um, thorns, right? It's the same thing. It's weeds, right? Now, I don't have the most beautiful yard in the world. I understand that. But, so, so forgive me because this parable it's against me in the physical realm. But the reason why it's against me in the physical realm is because I don't put that much importance on that. <laughs> I'm doing a lot of other things. I'm trying to serve God and not be as concerned about the aesthetics of the house. Now, I try to keep up with things as much as I can. There's a lot of work I got to do around the house, but that is not the highest on my priority list. There's a lot of other things that are very high, especially when it comes to soul winning and, and doing all the things of God that need to be done. So that takes a backseat. But my yard is a perfect example of this because there are so many weeds out there. Um, if you wanted to have a beautiful yard and everything looks nice, you're going to have no weeds in it, right? Well, if you want to have a beautiful life and have a great, wonderful life, you should have no sin in it. I'm relating the weeds to sin, okay? Now, the first point, turn if you would to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13 is actually the same chapter that, that gives the same parable of the sower, but we're not going to look at that um, account of the, of the sower. First thing I want to point about weeds is they can pop up overnight. And, but the weeds that are in our life, the sin that's in our life, is usually not there by accident. Now, they may, they may happen, you're one day to the next, you can start, those weeds can start to grow and you start to notice it. And that's why we have to be diligent every day about the sin in our life because just from what you could be doing pretty good for a while and then the very next day all of a sudden sin can start rearing its ugly head. Those weeds can very, just start popping up. Look at verse 24 of Matthew 13. It's another parable. Verse 24 says, Another parable put he forth unto them saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. 
The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, this is talking about a slightly, you know, a, 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 a somewhat different subject. It's talking about the, the kingdom of heaven in this parable. But it still fits in with my parable here because it's explaining that, you know, an enemy came and sowed those tares. An enemy comes and is sowing those seeds of wickedness and those seeds of sin. And we know that the devil and his devils and the people that work for him are, are the ones that are going to be trying to get you to sin and are going to be trying to sow seeds of sin in your life. And we need to be diligent about this because the Bible says here, while men slept. It says, but while men slept, the enemy came. See, when you're on guard and you're diligent about these things, about sin creeping in your life, the enemy's not going to be able to get in to even sow those seeds. It's when you're not paying attention, when you're real relaxed, and your guard is down, that they're gonna, the opportunity is going to come for sin to take root in your life. We need to be diligent to keep our yard clear of weeds. If I was being digi very digital about, about the, diligent about my physical yard here, it would have no weeds if I was just on top of it all the time, just yanking them out. But that hasn't been the case. Weeds, another thing about weeds, they're typically very shallow, right? The root doesn't seem to go down too deep, although after enough time, they can. But what happens is they have this really small root, but they spread out real far and wide on the surface and um, they try to cover as much area as possible and sometimes they'll even have flowers right you look at them and my kids are always like don't pull those up those are, you know like there's this pretty yellow flower or pretty white flower or something but they're weeds and I try to explain that to them look I said this one that has this this pretty yellow flower on it look at these things that are underneath it and they've got those big balls of stickers pointing all over the place I said you don't want to be stepping on that and what they do is they, they go out sideways and they choke out all of the grass and all the good stuff that we want to have in the yard. They basically, you know, they might deceptively appear to be harmless because, oh yeah, it looks just like there's some flowers in, 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 the, in the yard. And what they're really doing is just taking over and choking out all the nearby plants and grass and everything else. Mark uh, 4.19 says, that you don't have to turn there, this is from the parable we started off reading. It says, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. Sin, these weeds can be deceptive. They can be deceitful. And we want to make sure we're not deceived by the sins of this world, by, by any sin. You know, Satan is a master at getting sin to look appealing. It, to look enticing. To get you to do it. That's why he does it. That's why we have, you know, the beer ads up that show the people just having this great time and it's just this real fun thing without showing you the actual effects on your body, on your liver, on people that you love when you start going down that path of drinking booze. They don't show you the real effects of it. They just say, hey, this is a lot of fun. You should be doing this. Everybody's doing it. Show a big group of people. Oh, man, man, this is so much fun. You need to be doing this. And it's a deception. It's an illusion. It's like the flower on the weed, but what's underneath that? It's all the thorns that's going to that's gonna cut you and stab you. And that's the way sin truly is. And we need to not get deceived by the, by the ads, by, the, by Satan's trying to put these things up in a way that looks good. Now turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. First Corinthians chapter 5. When left unattended, the weeds can get out of control. And this is where we want to make sure we don't let ourselves get in this situation. Because if you just let it go, and on your way out of here tonight, just take a look at my front yard, that's what it looks like when you let it go. <laughs> you'll, see, you'll see how out of control it is. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to see um, an example of this about when sin can get out of control in people's lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, It is reported commonly, commonly, people are talking about this, this is common knowledge, that there is fornication among you, 
and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And here he's equating sin with leaven. And anyone who knows anything a little about leaven or baking bread, you, just, you only need a small amount for it to get into all of the dough so that the dough is able to rise and you can make that type of a bread. But what it does is, in a way, it infects the entire lump. It infects all of it. It, it, it impacts the whole thing. When you add a little bit of sin into your life, you could, you're going to affect everything. It's gonna, and it's going to spread and get, it could get out of control really, really fast. So in this situation, what he's telling them that they need to do, because here's someone who's doing, I mean, we're all sinners. I get that. But here's someone who's doing something that's really wicked. I mean, he says, he's, he's, not only is it just fornication, he has his father's wife. I mean, that is wicked, that is weird, that's bizarre, and that is, it is perverted, and that needs to be dealt with. And he says to this church, who's just kind of looking the other way, and they're just, oh, yeah, it's common knowledge, and nobody's doing anything about it. Well, guess what? When you leave that kind of wickedness in the, in the church, it's going to spread. It's going to grow. People are going to start growing more and more tolerant of other sins. Because if you're not going to say anything about this one, well, how could you possibly say anything about that one? Because now you're going to start just being a hypocrite. He says, no, you need to remove that wickedness out of the church. And he goes on to explain on, on about these different various sins that, can, that ought to actually get people kicked out of church. He says, you shouldn't even eat with these people. He says, don't even sit down and eat. If they're a railer or a drunkard or a, a fornicator, you know, all these different things. Anyone who's called a brother is saying, you're not even supposed to eat with them. He says that is wickedness that needs to be rooted out of the church before it starts to spread, before that leaven starts to infect everything. We need to make sure that these things don't get out of control because that's what's going to happen is when you leave it, when you see it and just say, okay, yeah, well, I'm just going to leave that there. It's going to spread. That's what weeds do and we need to make sure. And now this is talking about the church specifically, but in our individual lives is more what I'm focused on today is identifying these sins and don't just say like, oh, well, but I really like that, so I'm going to leave that alone. We need to get it out because otherwise it's gonna, it'll take over more than you even really, you might not even be able to fully understand that. And I, you know, I wasn't able to understand this for a long time when I like to cling to my sins that I like doing. And my big thing, and I've mentioned this before, was alcohol. How much I love to drink, but I didn't want to get rid of it. I knew it was wrong. I knew it wasn't right, but I thought, well, it's not that bad. I mean, that's the one thing I'm doing. I'm doing good in all these other areas. And this is kind of how I was thinking to myself. And that was already a haughty, foolish way to think about it anyways, because I wasn't doing that great in other areas. I just wasn't as bad as I was doing when I was going out and getting drunk and, and everything else that went along with that package. I wasn't nearly as good as I thought I was. But we need to make sure we're not allowing for these things in our life. And, and what happens is that that multiplies and it spreads into other things. When I was going out and getting drunk, the only sin I was doing was not just getting drunk. Because along with that came a whole bunch of other things. Bad thoughts, bad conversations, things that you know, a whole host of other things that shouldn't have been done. Even with the even with my music, the music that I love to listen to, this worldly music, this worldly influence, 
right? Coming out of the, the music industry is all from these godless, not God-fearing people, people who are atheists or even hating God, who are, who are blasphemously, you know, talking about church or Christ or religion or what have you. Listen to the lyrics sometime. It's not good. I could give you plenty of examples, but I love that. I love listening to that. I'd be like, yeah, you know, I kind of try to ignore the words, but you can't ignore it. And I found with myself as I struggled with that sin, every time I would, I would just indulge and let myself just, just get into that, I found myself getting into other sins as well. It all builds on each other. It's like a big snowball. It's like in this example, it's like weeds. They just keep growing and growing and growing and growing faster and faster and, and, and spreading out more and more areas of your life. Another thing about weeds is they actually get a lot harder to remove the bigger they get. And this is unfortunately what I was dealing with last week because <laughs> as I've mentioned before, I've let this stuff get out of control. So I'm out there thinking like, man, some of these are really hard to root up. They're really hard to get out of the ground because they've gotten just, I mean, there's like, some cases are like big bushes, right? I mean, there's these huge weeds. Now, for a long time, they have that pretty small root and it's not a big deal. And all the little ones, I'm just like, boom, 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 just pulling them out. But those big ones, man, you leave that sitting there for a while, that does get to become a problem. And it's the same thing with the sin in your life. The longer you let it grow, the longer you just don't, you just want to ignore it and you don't want to take care of it, when it comes down to time where you finally just say, you know what, I've got to deal with this, it will be way, 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 way harder to deal with it the longer you put it off. Take, uh, I mean, here's, here's a real simple example. Take smoking, right? You start smoking and you know it's a sin. You say, ah, I shouldn't do it, but I do it every once in a while. Every once in a while I get real stressed, I'll start smoking. And then after a while, you know, you tend to be getting stressed a little bit more frequently and you start smoking a little bit more. And the longer you let that continue and you become addicted to smoking cigarettes and then you start smoking, well, I only smoke a pack every week. And then it's, well, I smoke a pack, you know, two packs a week. Well, and then I'm smoking a pack a day. When you get to that point, it just, it just gets more and more, the thing's growing and growing and growing and digging a deeper root. Now, when you try to get rid of that, it's going to be way more difficult than if you would have just stopped right away. I mean, it makes sense. But this is, this is exactly how weeds are and this is how sin is in our life. And um, oftentimes when they get that big, when you let sin get that far out of control, it's a lot more likely to come back because when you try to get rid of it, you still leave some of the roots in the ground. And when you leave part of the roots in the ground, that's when it's able to come back. Turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 1 in the Old Testament. And see, that's why you have to pull the weeds out by the roots. You have to get all of the weed out. Because if you leave the roots in, they'll still end up just coming right back up again. You need to get the whole thing out. You need to not just, not just trim back on the sin. Not just trim back on the weed. Just say, oh, I'm going to just cut them down a little bit. Like, like I've been doing um, is just m lo uh, mowing the lawn. <laughs> just, just, just chop them a little bit short. But it hasn't worked. You can see for yourself. It just, it may, on the outside, the surface, if you're looking at it from far enough away, okay, yeah, it looks fine. And then as soon as you get a little bit closer, you're like, oh man, that's bad. <laughs> but get just, just chopping it down, whittling away at it a little bit, it's not going to get rid of the problem. You just might mask it for a little while. You need to have it completely rooted out. That'll get rid of it. And then you have to be diligent on watching to make sure it's not going to come back, that there's not going to be more of those tares sown. Jeremiah chapter 1, look at verse number 4. This is the Lord speaking unto Jeremiah. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. So he's encouraging Jeremiah. He's telling him, look, I'm sending you to be a preacher. 
And Jeremiah is just kind of like, you know, I'm a child. Like, I, I don't know what to say. I'm not, I'm not going to be very good at this, God. You know, why, why are you picking me? He says, look, I'm going to be with you. But I'm telling you right now, don't be afraid of their faces for what the things that you're going to be saying for God's word that he's going to be preaching unto people. You know, a lot of people don't like to hear that or don't like to receive that. So he's saying, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of their faces because I'm with you. And when you're preaching God's word, you could understand and have faith that God will be with you. So don't worry about what other people are saying. But let's keep reading here. Verse 9 says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And again, this is why we don't have to worry about what people are going to say or what people are going to think when you're actually preaching God's word because they're not your words. When people come at me, as I was mentioning this morning about the homos, and say, oh man, I can't believe you believe this and you believe that. Look, it's not something I came up with on my own. So if you want to get mad and angry and hate me for it, fine, I don't care. But this did not come out of my heart. It came out of, it, it's God's word. So when you have a problem with me, you can understand that too. You can understand that it's not you that they have the problem with, it's God. When you are actually preaching God's words. So when I read Leviticus 20.13, those are God's words. Those aren't my words. To say, if a man lie with mankind, he lieth with a woman, they too shall be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. That's God's words. That's not my word. I believe it because it's God's words. But it's not my words. I didn't come up with that. But I, I, you better believe I believe that. And if, if that makes people angry or upset, so be it. But they're his words. So he's saying, and, and like he did with Jeremiah, when Jeremiah was speaking, he was speaking the words that God gave him. God gave him. He said, these are my words and I want you to speak them. Look at verse number 10. And this, is, this shows us what he was sent to do. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. So in the preaching, one of the things that he was, his goal was to do is to root out. He's rooting out the wickedness. He's pulling down and destroying the strongholds of wickedness and of sin and the idolatry and everything else that was going on and destroying that. He's throwing it down. And look at these are all negative things. Root out, pull down, destroy, throw down. And then the last two is build and plant. And, and he's, he's supposed to be building the, the good way and the right way on top of that. But it takes a lot more effort to, to tear down and get rid of the wickedness. It takes a lot of work to do that. It takes a lot of work to, to build and to plant the new thing. But before you can even really start planting and growing, you need to get rid of the old stuff first. Before I can really effectively grow a nice lawn with good grass in it, I need to get rid of those weeds. Because there's no room for it right now. If I, if it's going to be vanity for me to try to plant grass seeds out there right now. It's not going to work. I need to get rid of all the bad stuff first. Then I can plant. Then I can build. And it's the same way in your life. We need to get rid of the wickedness and the sin that has crept in and get that out of your life so you can start building fresh and building new and doing what's right. Get the old stuff out. Now those roots of those weeds, they're so shallow when you first catch them popping up, they're very easy to get rid of. But you have to be diligent to be always looking for them and to spot them in order to take them out so that it keeps them from getting out of control. And as soon as you get lazy or distracted, that's when they're going to start spreading and entrenching themselves. Now turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Because what happens when you let things go like they are with, with my yard in the front there, when things get too bad, all of a sudden you just have an entire lawn full of weeds or entire life full of sin. You just let it all go. The owner, so I'm the owner of that lawn, I'm just going to till that lawn and start all over again. Because right now, it's, it's kind of beyond repair. It's going to be foolish for me just to go and pull up every single individual weed. I'm just going to want to just... just turn the whole thing up on its end and start from scratch and just wipe it all out and clear it out. Now, if you're in Luke 13, look at verse number 6. This is why we need to beware of the sins that we allow in our life. Luke 13, verse 6 says, He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. 
Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Now again, this is a parable, but what he's saying here is, saying, okay, I've got this fig tree, right? For three years, I'm letting, I'm letting it go. Okay, this year, is there anything coming out? Any fruit? Nope, no figs. Next year, any fruit? Nope, no figs. So you're saying, okay, this tree is worthless to me. I have this fig tree and it's not even producing any figs. Why should I even have it in my ground? I'll just plant something else in there that's going to produce fruit. So, um, and that's what he says unto a servant. A certain, you know, he's like, well, wait. He's like, let's give it one more year. He's like, let me dig about it. I'll dung it. I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever I can to really try to get this thing to produce fruit. But if it still doesn't produce, we're going to get rid of it. Now look, God can do the same thing. Turn, if you would, to John 15. God can do the same thing with us. Okay? When you get saved and you start learning and you start growing, you're kind of like a plant. Right? God wants you to bear fruit. This is the will of God that we bear much fruit. That's what He wants for us. He wants us producing for Him. He is the owner, right? Just like I'm the owner of this yard, and if it just gets too out of control, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to wipe it out. God has bought us. He's purchased us with the blood of Jesus Christ. He wants us working and being fruitful for Him. Now, how is he going to think if he comes to you, Christian, year after year after year, and you're just not doing anything for God? He's going to be like, well, what are you even doing here then? See, I believe we're all here for a reason. God has a reason for us. He has plans for us to do things in our life. And I'll tell you what it's not. It's not just to make a whole bunch of money and to just spend it all on yourself and satisfy yourself and, and that's it. And you're just going to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That's not why God has you on this earth. He wants you to bring fruit for Him. Godly fruit, good fruit, converting souls. That's bearing fruit. When you can reproduce yourself. If you're born again today, you're a Christian, you're a child of God. When you reproduce, you are bringing forth other Christians. You're getting other people saved. You're leading them to Christ. That's how you multiply. That's how you become fruitful. God wants that for all of us today. And when He could keep on coming back and coming back and coming back and you're not doing anything, He's kind of like, well, why are you cumbering the ground? You're in John 15. Look at verse number 1. We're going to see another parable which explains the same exact thing. Jesus Christ speaking in verse number 1. I am the true vine and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me, so there's people who are saved, a branch that's in Christ, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So God can have a plan for your life, but if you just keep on screwing up that plan and just not want to listen to God, not want to do what he has for you to do, and you just, just time after time again, you decide to just, just not, not want to do it. I don't want to do it. Well, God can very easily just take you away. Now again, I'm not saying you're going to lose your salvation. But you will lose out on a lot of other things. You'll lose out on the rewards. You'll lose out on a lot of, a lot of blessings and good things that we do get from this life. If God just says, well, I'm just, I'm just done with you. I've had enough. And I believe in, in, uh, in the book of Acts, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, his wife. I believe that they were saved. You know, again, I, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. But just for arguments, like let's say they're saved, you know, they commit a sin and they bring forth this money and they're lying and they, they want to bring forth their, uh, their donations unto the church. And they, kinda, they, they want people to think, oh, wow, they, you know, they sold their property and they gave all this money to the church when they actually kept back some for themselves. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is because they died right on the spot. We're like, so did you sell the property for this muster? They're like, yep. And they said, well, you haven't lied unto men, you've lied unto God. And God just decided to end their life. Now, it doesn't mean they lost their salvation, but their life was cut short on this earth. We ought not to want our lives just cut short and to just be 
cast away as nothing. And, but that can happen. And we need to realize that God is capable of doing that and he's done it in the past and he can do it again. And we see from these two parables, he said, hey, I mean, if you're not bearing fruit, if you're not doing what I have for you to do, the whole reason why you're here, though, your whole purpose, why, then what are you there for? You're not doing any of it. Now, God's long-suffering and he's merciful and he'll work with you for a long time. But after, you know, after so long, God's just like, okay, well, you're, just out, you're kind of wasting space here. I'll get someone else in there that's going to that's gonna do the job. I mean, if, if, if my trees that I have out front, if they don't produce fruit, I mean, that's the reason why we bought these trees. It wasn't just for beautification. We want the fruit that's going to come from them. So if I'm not getting apples, if I'm not getting cherries, if I'm not getting nectarines or whatever, all the other things that, that my wife bought, if we don't start getting those, if those trees don't start producing after a while, I mean, we're going to give it time. They're young, right? They need to, they need to grow. They need to, to, well, not learn. We need to learn if we're applying it to ourselves. We need to grow. And God will give us the time that we need. But when the time comes, he's just like, look, you ought to be producing by this point. Then that's what you're going to deal with. And it's going to be the same thing with those fruit trees. If I get to the point where I'm like, you know, these things have been growing and growing and growing and they're not bringing forth anything. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yank them out. I'm going to uproot them and put something else in its place. And then I'll, I'll burn the tree in my, in my fire pit over here because it's good for nothing at that point. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't get to that point to where we're just good for nothing. So when you spot the weeds early, you can easily pluck them up by the roots and get rid of them. But, um, but you have to pay attention to not let them grow. Now... Um, Let's just use some real life. That, that's my parable of the weeds and how they relate to sin. And there's kind of a lot of, of aspects to them and attributes of weeds that you can see how, how they're real similar to, to sin in our life. But let's just apply this to a couple specific sins, right? Um, and how you can notice the small weeds just getting started. Because usually it starts, um, for example, like I have, I have here... You know, smoking a cigarette or taking a drink. It starts when you have a real rough day, right? And for some reason or another, you think, well, I deserve this. Or it's just, one, you know, like I've just, things have just gone really bad. So I'm just going to relax. I'm going to relieve some stress. I'm just going to do this this one time. And, and you know what? When you do that, you're opening up the door. You're allowing that weed to sprout up. Now, if you do find yourself in that situation, yank it out right away. Get rid of it. If you say, you know what, that was really stupid. I'm, never, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to touch it. I'm going to get rid of that and get that out of my life. That is the way, the, the way that you need to react, respond to that. But unfortunately, what happens is we make excuses for the weeds being there. And be like, well, I kind of like that weed. It's got, it's got this little flower. It's just starting to sprout up. I wonder what it's going to look like. I know it's got some thorns in there and stuff, but, but I, I want to see what that flower looks like. And we let it sit there and I let it grow. And then it starts to take a little bit further root. And then it starts expanding and growing. And it's like, well, wait, 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 wait. No, I didn't, I didn't want the weed going all the way over there. No, I, I like that over there. And you start smoking, you start drinking, it's going to start affecting other areas of your life that you, you didn't want it to go there. You didn't want it affecting your relationship with your wife or with your husband or with your girlfriend or whatever or with your family or what, you know. I didn't, I didn't want to cause these other problems. But now all of a sudden it is. Another source, maybe it's not you just having a bad day and you're like, you know, no, I'm smarter than that. I've got this handled. But when you decide to get some of the, the programming from the television, I mean, when you look at the TV guide, it's also called the programming. And it's called the programming for a reason. Because that's exactly what the television and the movies are doing. They're trying to program your brain trying to program you to think a certain way about whatever their agenda is. And I'll tell you what, the agenda of Hollywood is not a good agenda. It's not a God-fearing agenda, that's for sure. It's the ways of this world. And, you know, you don't look to Hollywood to find the most godly people in the world. That's actually the last place. That's, that's the, like the pit of hell for, for righteous living. It's, it's, there is no righteous living coming out of Hollywood, yet that is where the programming is coming from. And the more you allow yourself to just take it in, take it in, well, 
I like all the explosions. I like the action. I like whatever. I like the eye candy. Well, you know what they're also doing? They're pumping messages into your head subliminally without you even thinking about it. So, yeah, but I can recognize it. I know. I, I could see it, and, and I just don't listen to that part, or I don't believe that part. You know what? Over time, it wears you down. You may be that, that strong the first time or the second time, but when you start to hear things over and over and over again, you don't think about it as much. It starts to become commonplace. It starts to become normal. And it's this normalization of sin has gotten us to the point to where we're at today. When people just start to think, oh, that's not a shock. I mean, the first time, and it's amazing because we could understand this. Everyone in this room is old enough to know that things haven't always been nearly as drastic as they are today than from when they were 10 years ago. Right? And for those of us that are, that are getting old, you know, getting upwards near 40 like I am, can think back, and especially if you've watched TV and listened to music and all that stuff, you go back just a decade and then another decade and then another decade and you start to think, what was it really like? What was extreme and shocking 20 years ago? What's 20 years ago? 2015, 1995, it's 20 years ago, right? Isn't that right around the time that like you might have possibly seen maybe like, like in a comedy some kind of homosexuality that was just like, you know, like two guys kissing or something that was just like a total joke, not like they're in love with each other, but just like this, just throwing it out there, right? Now it's probably in like every sitcom and it's, it's disgusting and it's not just a joke anymore. And it's, it's so easy to, to use that as a, as a topic because it's so wicked of a sin and we need to understand that. But as the time has gone on, you've been desensitized and desensitized and desensitized through that programming to where now so many people don't even think it's a big deal. So I don't see what the big deal is about it. Other than God says it's abomination and it's worthy of the death penalty. Th that minor detail. Yeah, I don't, I don't see what's so bad about it. I don't see what's so bad about living in fornication or committing adultery. Because you're pumped through full of the programming all the time. You're watching adulterers and adulteresses on the screen all the time. And you're hearing these stories about how people are on their third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh wives. Becomes to not be as big of a deal anymore. They start off seeming harmless, these sins, these little weeds, but they can literally end up destroying your life when they go ignored. How about fornication? I'm going I'm to close on the sin of fornication. Because that's, a, that's rampant in the world today. Rampant. People, I mean, and it's starting with kids younger and younger and younger because it's not being taught or preached against. It's actually contrarily being taught as being normal. And being, well, that's what you do when you're young. And there's all the movies that come out of the people who fall in love when they're young. And then they go and they have their one night stands and they have these things and one thing leads to another. And it's just perfectly normal. And it's acceptable. And now it's just, it's just part of life. No, it doesn't have to just be a part of life. We need to teach against this. Let's see what the Bible says about this. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Because here's the thing with fornication. It doesn't start from you just being single one day, you're going to church, you're reading the Bible, you're going out sowing, you're doing all these things for God, and then the very next day, all of a sudden, boom, you just commits fornication. That's not how it happens. That's not how these sins happen. They start smaller than that. You don't go just all of a sudden you have this major weed in your life. It's, it's something that happens and it builds up to that event. There are other things that are involved. For example, people might get loneliness and, and it gets magnified by the television and by the music and by these other influences in your life. Or when you're allowing yourself to be put in more and more situations of temptation and before you know it, fornication has reared its ugly head. And you start allowing yourself to be involved in things that you ought not to be involved with. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse number 8. Let's get a reminder about this. Verse number 8, 1 Corinthians 10. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day 
3 and 20,000. This is talking about the children of Israel when they had come out of the land of Egypt and, and Moses was leading them out and they made that, that false idol when Moses was up in the mountain. And it says, you know, they commit fornication and because of their fornication, 23,000 people lost their lives. This is how God views fornication, what we call just sleeping around, right? Having a relationship with a girl or a man, whatever, whoever you are, outside of marriage. That's called fornication. And when you do that, when, when these people did it, 23,000 people died from the hand of God. Galatians chapter 5. Turn if, you would, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 5. Well, I'm going to read from Galatians 5. Galatians 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. And it goes on and on with the whole list. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 3 says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint's. You know what? That's what the world does, but that's not what God wants His people to do. And if you're born again, you are a saint. You are sanctified through the blood of Jesus Christ. He says, don't even let it once be named among you. Fornication ought never be mentioned. That should never be something that a Christian does. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6. I'm almost done. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. That's God's will for your life, abstaining from fornication, not letting yourself give in to that desire of your flesh to commit fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. He's saying that's what the world does. You ought to know how to control yourself, how to have sanctification, how to have honor and respect unto God and unto yourself. That you don't let this into your life. This fornication will destroy you. As it destroyed 23,000 people when, when the, Moses was leading them out of Egypt. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse number 15. Look at verse number 15 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid! What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. When you are committing that sin of fornication, that filthy act in God's eyes. You are making yourself one flesh with someone else that's not your wife. That's a sin. He says, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. What you're saying, the Holy Ghost is residing inside of you. And you have made yourself one with someone else outside of God's plans and in and, and disobedience to God's rules. This is a major sin. And because not enough people are standing up and preaching against this, it's happening way too often. Way too often. We ought to have more respect as a Christian, as a child of God, to be able to bring honor unto his name. So that people could look at you, you could stand upright and say, you know what? I love God and I love his, his word and I, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That ought to have some weight and some meaning with you. But your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's God's temple. Keep it pure. Keep it holy. 1 Corinthians 7, the next chapter over, verse number 1. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1 says, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, 
to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. This is God's plan so that you don't have to be involved in fornication. He's saying, look, God made us the way we are. We have, we have desires. We have, we have um, this flesh that wants to, wants to have that relationship. Do it the right way. Do it God's way. That's what he's saying. He's saying, look, I provided a way for you to enjoy this and, and it's a beautiful thing and it can be part of your, a beautiful part of your life. If you do it, he says, look, make sure whatever you do, don't commit fornication. He says, and in order to avoid that, have a wife. Get married. That way you won't be committing this awful sin of fornication. That's his way of doing it. But look, we need to make sure that it never, that's a, made, that's a serious sin. And, and again, a lot of people didn't even realize, I know my wife didn't even realize that that was a sin growing up because she had no biblical teaching whatsoever. She didn't even know that that was wrong. She didn't even know that was a sin. And that's part of the problem with this entire society is because people aren't teaching about it. I knew it was wrong growing up, but I didn't really know why and I didn't really know how bad it was. If I knew how bad it was in God's eyes, even when I wasn't saved, I probably wouldn't have done it because I still believed in God. If I would have known that this is that serious and that bad, I probably wouldn't have done it. It's a sin I'm guilty of, yes. But it's wickedness. And we need to make sure that the little weeds that are growing up in our life, that we're not allowing them to grow and become bigger to, where, to the point to where we're committing major sins in God's eyes and things that are, that are abominable in His sight. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words and for the parables that the, the Bible has for us, dear God. I pray that you would please just um, help us all to be diligent to keep our bodies, to keep our minds, to keep our spirits pure, dear Lord, and to watch out for all the signs of the sin and the wickedness that's going to be creeping up. We have this flesh. We have to battle it every day, dear Lord. That's why we have to be diligent and, and, and make sure we're not allowing the little things to come into our life and, and not getting worn down with, the, with either the attacks or with just the, the constant exposure to sin. God, help us to limit that exposure so that we're not just um, find ourselves being desensitized or um, giving in to the, to the barrage and the attack that, that Satan is, is coming in and trying to plant these tares, dear Lord. Help us to, to be mindful of them. Help us to get rid of that stuff as soon as, it, as, soon as we recognize, as soon as we see it, dear Lord just to get out of our life so that we don't let it um, really take root and become a major problem or a thorn in our flesh to have to get rid of, dear Lord. We love you. We thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.